In this play, we've been rehearsing for oh months, months, months and months daily. David's been oh, crazy. David's been driving us crazy. <laughs> That's the director. He's good. But he's been teaching us the David Ford School of Acting. <laughs> At me, I was taking years to walk there with the day. I had a wolf dressed up in this pink party dress, my aunt Peter got up from bed with her, I had a hair off from it, so nice, the uh, little lacy ankle that's got another party, she's so beautiful, perfect. Hours, it took me hours to get here. Hey Bruce, are you still writing those solo theater pieces? Yeah, I got an idea. Why don't you write a piece about me? And don't make me look too psychotic. <laughs> There's something very unusual in the collaborative relationship between a uh, collaborator director and the writer performer. One moment that comes to mind on our first collaboration, I must have just been kind of doing this character who wasn't going to be in the show. And you said, wait, wait, let's do something with this. I remember leaving that rehearsal very surprised that something I did not think was going to be in the show seemed to be joining the show. What is it that in that moment, jumped out at you and said, this is something that should be part of the show. That's funny. I always thought it's because you liked him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a kind of state of being in, in rehearsal, which is, it is physically somewhat like I'm not in my body, I'm in the other person's body. So if I was identifying anything, I was, it, was, it would be, that gives you so much pleasure. Can we keep, uh, that lights me up too. When we make those statements as artists, when we make those discoveries, that these little things that tickle us, a lot of people just stop there. It's, it's terrifying to have the courage of your own imaginative leap and, and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. I mean, there's these strange parts of this job, really strange parts of it, where um, somebody will start telling me an event from their life and then I'll say, are you sure it didn't happen more like this? And I'll, ma I'll make a suggestion. And they'll start playing around with that. And then they'll go, oh, now I remember. Oh, my car stinks. Last night I cat climbed through the window and it took a leak. And that's why me and my friends got to drive with the windows down. <laughs> and who's the genius who's running this group? resistance. I don't care what resistance his parents fought in. He's an idiot. <laughs> and you're an idiot to be going to him. Stop throwing logs on the Holocaust fire. It's over. Close the door. Move on. The next morning, her neighbors are out there cleaning and shoveling and restoring order. And Kathy is simply paralyzed and in awe at what nature had wrought. I just don't understand how the Yankees can get out there and clean it up before they have time to absorb the magnificence of the disaster. My roommate, Michael, <laughs> is screaming into the TV remote, trying to get an outside line. <laughs> As he dials, the television cycles through all of the channels. You didn't start out with the idea of becoming a director. Talk no. about how you wound up as one. Uh, as an undergraduate, I actually was interested in design. And I, was, I took a course at the Yale School of Drama. One of the few courses I ever took in directing, um, I took a two-week thing with Joe Chaikin. You know, it's fairly straightforward directing stuff, you know, where, where you don't really learn anything. You learn what you, you really kind of already know about it. And, and um, we had to do scenes. And I did a couple scenes from Medea. And um, a afterwards, he, you know, he gave sort of conventional kind of feedback on it. And then I said, well, what would you do next? Which I knew was kind of violating some law of teaching. You know, you, do, you don't ask that, and the teacher doesn't do that. But I, I really wanted to see. I just wanted to know what would be his next move as a director, because I just thought that would be so interesting to know. He thought about it a second, and then um, he goes to the moment between the two scenes, a moment with which I'd done nothing, as though there's any time on stage in which nothing's happening or that where, where it, it doesn't have to be brought alive. Um, and he goes to that moment, and he asks the woman who's 
playing Medea, who I later married, um, he, he, uh, he asks her to start walking around this chair, and he says in his you know, broken language, because he's aphasic, he says, um, heart, heart, like bomb, like bomb, but control. And he, he does this gesture like that, and um, he's so present with her. He, he's kind of he's very with her on this, he's, you know. And and he, he's just kind of like saying, "Try this. Try going into this." And and at some point, she's walking around, and then she like wails with this cry of anguish, which was very like, "Wow!" So I get two things from that. I got two things. It's it's like it felt like the only thing I've ever learned about directing except by kind of doing it or watching it be done, which is to ask for more. And at the same time, to be present with the other person when you're asking. I want the kind of telephone that all of the people in the Soviet Union wanted so badly, they dismantled their entire government in order to get it. I want the kind of so badly, they took all those asbestos bricks of the wall down one at a time in order to get, I want a freedom phone, I want a freedom phone, I want an American flag waving freedom phone. Me, I'm an Afro-Japanese Muslim communist, a terrorist, a leftist guerrilla trainer, I'm a black Mexican, I'm a border crosser, ID snatching, fake counter bill having bank robber, and a thug Budafarian, Mormon. <laughs> I'd love to step out of that bed and wake up and stretch and be destroying nations and creating industries and stepping into print, stepping into history, doing things in the morning that are that evening or on the evening news. That's me. That's George Cudahy. Happy and on the evening news. <laughs> What's the difference between uh, showing up when somebody else is inhabiting a moment, a scene, a character, uh, and going into your own. Yeah, um, I started playwriting late, um, and it was all, it, it, it would not have happened without having done this other kind of work. It feels like it very much comes from that, that practice I was just talking about, being able to show up for other human beings and then and sort of disappearing into a world that they're describing, which for me is, is a, 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 set, a world, world separate from myself, not my world. You know, uh, people are going, I mean, we have all these divisions in our culture right now, so I'm not supposed to be able to work with Marga Gomez because she's a Puerto Rican lesbian. And yet, you know, it's so easy to disappear into Marga's world because she so invites you in. I, I feel like I was learning through that how to start showing up for characters who I, I made out of my own heart. With rebirthing, you focus on your breathing. And you fall into this trance, and you go back to your youth, to what they call the child within. And you relive that pain, and you heal it, and it costs $90 an hour. <laughs> I was slow. It took me hours. I kept getting distracted. I got stuck at 21 for three hours trying to fake an orgasm. <laughs> then I had my breakthrough, and I found my child within. And I cried for the first time in my life, and my therapist began to ask my child, what does the little girl want? What does the little girl really want? What does the little girl really, really want? <laughs> I couldn't tell my therapist what I really wanted, because even through my pain, I remember thinking, the little girl wants her money back. <laughs> Mama Bell dipped snuff, just a pinch between the teeth and gum, you know, and there was always a hint of it at the corner of her mouth. <laughs> old coffee can, always next to that overstuffed chair she sat in. In the middle of a conversation, Mama Bell would just lean over and spit into the can. It put most people off. <laughs> and I'm up in my room and I'm finally taking off my itchy sport coat when I hear a knocking at the front door. Well, actually, knocking is not really the right word. It's more like a banging and a pounding. I come downstairs and open the door to find a little blonde girl about my age, an older woman, apparently her mother, and a white mob 
there on our front porch. I'm talking 15, 20 people all crammed up on our front porch and up against the green picket fence that surrounded the patio that was adjacent to the front door. There was a little raggedy boy, about seven, a woman with her head tied up with a bandana, cigarette dripping from her mouth, and a teenage boy wearing a Confederate flag tank top. I felt like Nostradamus looking at a Jerry Springer premonition. <laughs> I would find a kid in the Hitler Youth, knock him out with a karate chop, put on his uniform, placing in the pocket papers I had forged that identified me as Director General of the Nazi Department of Moving Pictures Youth Division and authorizing me and my crew to interview the Fuhrer. Now, of course, these documents would have dozens of seals, rubber-stamped approvals, official signatures, which were sure to fool the authority-loving Germans. Once in Hitler's office, my associates, also Jews dressed as Hitler Youth, would begin setting up the lights. I would take a light meter reading off of Hitler's face, all the while making small talk about the final solution. Then, without warning, I would flick open the light meter, revealing a dagger, and I would slit Hitler's throat. All of this would be filmed, of course. The film tossed out the window, smuggled to the Allies, so the whole world would know that Hitler was dead. I, meanwhile, would escape to Palestine, later become the first Prime Minister of Israel, barely edging out David Ben-Gurion. <laughs> You've worked with me on a lot of material about uh, what it is to be Jewish and American. You're not Jewish. You've worked with Brian Copeland on Not a Genuine Black Man, with Wayne Harris on Train Stories. You've worked with uh, women on lots of material about growing up um, female. Uh, so you've had this extraordinary opportunity to extend yourself into other people's worlds. It's, it's, a, it's a defiance, it seems to me, of, of the, the way a lot of people are moving now, where if you're black, you work in a black theater company. If you're Jewish, you need a Jewish director, and so forth. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm trying to remember how old I was when the I Had a Dream speech happened. Which, what year was that? 63? 63, I think, yeah. So I would have been six or seven. And it was on TV, and my parents watched. And to me, that, that is, to me, the defining, that defined in me what it was to be an American. Uh, you know, I was just in an age where I could just kind of understand it. I could certainly get the passion of it. And I'd been saying, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd been, you know, and, and not really understanding the words and, and learning about the Declaration of Independence, but not really understanding the words. And here's this man, you know, and telling us what these words mean. And, uh, and, you know, I thought that's the way it should be, as a kid does. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 you know, I wanted to be able to be that way in some little way, I don't know.